Well, hello, folks, and welcome back to Skybound on the Ground with Michael Lombard. My name is Michael Lombard. Uh, last time we learned about airplane components and how you can recognize what an airplane looks like and what the different parts are on it, but we didn't learn what causes an airplane to fly. So that's exactly what, what we're going to be dealing with today in the basic principles of flight. And just for the information, uh, today's lesson uh, is based on information found in the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, Chapter 3, which is the uh, FAA's publication. You can download that for free off the FAA's website. And no, I'm not an FAA representative, nor do they necessarily endorse my views. Okay, that aside, uh, let's get on with it. So how in the world do airplanes fly? If you would have, take a look at the components that we looked at the airplane, what do you think would be the most important part out of those five things uh, to, to allow an airplane to fly? You got the power plant, you got the fuselage, you got the empennage, the landing gear, you got the wings. Uh, so what do you think is the most important part on an airplane in terms of flying? I guess that's kind of a, a bit of an unfair question because it's kind of like asking what's the most important body system. Uh, they're all important, aren't they? But if you would have to narrow it down to what I think it would be the wings, that's really the thing that's most directly involved in flying. Uh, but how in the world do wings actually um, fly? And that is a very good question. So let's take a trip to the moon. And let's not just go by ourselves. Let's actually take this guy along with us. Uh, we couldn't find an eagle, so we found the closest pigeon. And uh, so we're going back to the moon. And uh, so we land on the moon. First of all, we gave our little pigeon a, uh, some sort of a protected device uh, so that he can actually go out with us onto the lunar surface and not uh, get instantly killed. So we step onto the moon. That's one small step for man, an even smaller step for this pigeon. And as soon as he gets out onto the surface, he sees all this wonderful expanse, the lunar mountains, valleys, plains, and the first thing this pigeon wants to do is spread his wings and fly. And so that's exactly what he attempts to do. And he takes a leap and a bound and sails through... Oh, it's not air up there. So he sails through the vacuum and slams back down onto the lunar surface. So why in the world... Was the bird not able to fly up there? That's because there is no air. So if you have wings, you got to have air to go over those wings. And what do you know? We live in a wonderful atmosphere on this planet called Earth. And this atmosphere, because we have one, we're able to use these things called wings to fly an airplane. So let's take a look at this atmosphere. Now, just imagine that, first of all, that you're inside... Um, you're going swimming and you got a nice deep pool and uh, you drop something and you have to go and retrieve it from the very bottom of the pool. So you splash down into the water and you start diving down and as you go down deeper and deeper, 15 feet, maybe 30 feet, what's happening to your ears? You're starting to feel pressure on them, right? Um, it feels like something's driving into your skull and maybe your face mask, if you're wearing one, you're starting to feel that pressing against your face. Well, that's exactly what's happening. You've got all this pressure on you because you have the weight of all the water on top of you now as you go down to the bottom. Well, it's actually the same thing with our atmosphere. So let's take a look at it. We actually live in a giant pool, except this pool isn't filled with water. This pool is filled with air. And at the bottom we have buildings, and we have mountains, and clouds, and uh, maybe some people down there. So that is our atmosphere. And just using the pool analogy, we are down here, and we have all the weight of the atmosphere bearing down on top of us. And yes, gas has weight. And you can actually measure how much weight or pressure this gas, gas exerts on us. And if you were to take a <clears throat> dish and put mercury in it. So we're gonna have a little petri dish or whatever, and we're gonna put mercury inside here. And we have the atmosphere pressing down on top of this. It has weight, remember, because it has mass. And we're gonna take, we're gonna try to figure out how much force this is exerting uh, on a surface. And we're using the mercury as our surface. So we're gonna take a uh, hollow tube that has a vacuum inside it and we're going to put that in the mercury and we're going to see how far this mercury travels up the tube 
well it'll go up almost 30 inches it'll actually uh, if you're down at sea level on a standard conditions day it will go up to just shy of 30 inches 29.92 inches and so that's how much force the atmosphere is exerting on you down at sea level now let's go back to our pool <clears throat> the one that we live in and take a look here what happens when you go up and stand on top of this mountain well you are now no longer at the bottom of the pool you don't have all this um, gas that you don't have the entire weight of the atmosphere down on on, um, on top of you now and so there's going to be less pressure on you and the way things work with gases you have these little molecules that are zinging around all over the place and you can compress it by increasing the pressure and if you have a fixed volume and you and if you have a, a certain volume and you make that volume smaller the molecules inside they're going to be squished closer together well the same thing works with the atmosphere you have the atmosphere is bearing down on, you know, you have the, um, down at the bottom, the pressure is greater, and so these molecules are going to be much closer together. If you go up higher, like up to the top of, uh, let's say, the Mount Shasta over here, the air is going to be less dense because there's less atmospheric pressure compressing those molecules together. If you go all the way up to 18,000 feet, right over here, Excuse my terrible handwriting and uh, the board. Oh yeah, by the way, I'm not using the whiteboard right now because uh, I need to find some odorless markers. It was causing quite the uh, stench in here. And I, I don't want to uh, be that kind of a high pilot. Uh, anyway, uh, so you go up to 18,000 feet and you actually are going to have half the atmospheric pressure that you had down at sea level. Okay, so that's an important principle that we're going to be running into quite a lot as we go through our lessons, especially when it comes to aircraft performance. Um, the more pressure you have, atmospheric pressure, the more dense the air is going to be. And yeah, when the air is denser, it's going to be thicker. And uh, as you go up higher, you're going to have less dense air because you have less atmospheric pressure. Now, can you think of anything else, other factors that might... Uh, vary that might cause the atmospheric density, uh, how close these molecules are together, to vary. So think of um, uh, summer versus winter time. Okay, that, that's kind of vague. Um, hot and cold. Temperature. Temperature has a very big part to play. And uh, let's take a look. <clears throat> let's, uh, let's blow up a balloon, shall we? Okay, so we're going to blow up our balloon and we're going to do something uh, we're not going to blow it all the way up. We're going to blow it about halfway up. So here's our balloon. I'm uh, kind of drawing it on its side. And uh, we're going to do something a little bit unorthodox to it. We're uh, going to do a little experiment. I'm going to put it on top of a camp stove. And uh, of course we have to light the camp stove. Otherwise there's really no point to doing this. So what do you think is going to happen as you have this balloon sitting over the camp stove? and it's heating up what's happening to the gas inside. Well, the molecules are starting to get really excited and they're zinging around and they start spreading out. Yeah, you know, you, the, you can just envision it. The balloon is starting to expand and get bigger and bigger and bigger. There's our lovely camp stove, probably made by MSR, like a little MSR pocket rocket. And pow, okay. And there goes our balloon. So what was happening? As you increase temperature, the density of the air inside that container started decreasing. That's why the balloon started getting bigger and bigger, because those molecules are spreading apart. So that means when you increase temperature, air density decreases. So we have two factors now that we can think of. As you go higher up and the atmospheric pressure decreases, so does, so does atmospheric density. As you increase the temperature, so the, as you increase the temperature, atmospheric uh, density also decreases. <clears throat> and if that is kind of uh, uh, kind of hard to wrap your mind around it, just write it down, and uh, and you can see it. Um, anyway, okay. So moving on here, uh, there is one more factor that we haven't talked about. First of all. 
Uh, let's uh, let's look at what our atmosphere is made up of. Um, naturally, you're going to say, what do we breathe? Oxygen, right? Well, you'd be surprised to find out, or you might be surprised, you may have known this already, but I was surprised when I first found this out, that our atmosphere is actually not made of 100% of oxygen. If you look at this pie chart over here, you'll find out that 78% of our atmosphere is actually made up of this inert gas called nitrogen. Yeah, so you, when you take a deep breath, most of that is actually nitrogen. 21% is that lovely life-giving gas called oxygen. And then the remaining 1% <clears throat> is made up of who knows what else. Uh, greenhouse gases like carbon, di carbon dioxide and methane and uh, actually um, if people would stop eating cows and stop having so many cows for the beef and dairy industry there would be a lot less methane in our atmosphere and you could probably prevent global climate change simply by going vegetarian um, but that's a whole nother topic for another uh, venue uh, but anyway, uh, moving along here, right along here, so you can see our, our atmosphere, it's made up of that. Um, now, remember, each of these components have mass to them, and they um, basically, that's basically weight. And if you look at nitrogen gas, you got two molecules, you have these two molecules of nitrogen hooked together, and that makes a nitrogen gas mo molecule, and then you have two atoms, sorry, atoms that are hooked together, two atoms of oxygen that make an oxygen gas molecule. What happens when you introduce water vapor to the mix? Look at water vapor. So this is going back to our chemistry days in high school. Um, so, okay, look at N2, O2, H2O. There's only one oxygen in there and two very, very light hydrogens. If you introduce um if you introduce water vapor to the mix, water vapor is actually a lot lighter than the other two gases. And so, if that is taking up some of the room um, in this parcel of air, you're actually going to have a less dense chunk of air because the water that's taking up some of that room is a lot lighter than the oxygen and the nitrogen. It doesn't make a huge amount of difference, but it does make enough difference if you're a jungle pilot flying down where it's 100% humidity and uh, it's hot out there as well. So there's, there are these considerations. So the three factors that affect um, air, air density is number one, pressure. As you go up higher, air density decreases. Uh, number two, temperature. As you make things hotter, air density decreases. And number three, as you introduce water vapor to the mix, air density decreases as well. All right, so we know that we need an atmosphere. We need air in order for our wings to work. But how in the world do the wings work in the first place? And that is a question that people tried to solve for hundreds of years, and it produced quite a lot of problems because they looked at the birds and they figured birds have wings they use their wings, birds know how to fly, and we should copy them, uh, since they know how to do it, that must be the key. And so, for hundreds of years, people were obsessed with the idea of making something that flapped in order to get into the air. But it never really worked out. Uh, there's several reasons for that, because, for one thing, birds are a lot lighter than any contraption you could make out of uh, sticks and uh, who knows what they were using. Um, and so when they finally figured out to, okay, let's forget about the flapping idea, we just need to figure out some way to get air flowing over the wings. Then, voila, you had Kitty Hawk, the Wright brothers, and now we have airplanes today, and you and I can become pilots and fly those things. So the, re the key really was having air flowing over the wings. That is the most basic principle of how an airplane flies, how a wing is able to lift an airplane up into the air. You have to have air flowing over it. So, now that we know that we have to have air flowing over things, we want to find out exactly how that even works, how that makes it possible. So, why don't you and I take a look at a wing? 
and uh, let me draw one here. We're going to look at the sideways view of it from the wingtip, uh, or cross section of it. So here's, uh, here's the wing, and we're going to have it pointing up at a little bit of an angle. So uh, here's the leading edge of the wing, this is the front of the wing, and here's the trailing edge. And if you want, I can write that down. So that's the leading edge, that's the front. And this is the trailing edge because it trails behind the wing. Okay, so here's our wing. And we need some way to move it forward through the air. So remember we have a power plant on the airplane. Uh, in this case it's a propeller. And so that's our means of propulsion. We fire up the engine and we start the wing moving through the air. And uh, if you were standing on top of the, uh, the wing right here, let's make that a... Uh, it's going to be a very large wing and a very small U. And you start moving the wing forward. So that's the direction of flight. You start moving the. Can you even? <laughs> can you even read? Yeah, sorry, it's a little bit small. Anyway, um, you start moving the wing forward. You start feeling this breeze blowing past you, and if you were wearing one of those cool silk scarves that the old aviators wore, then you'd start having that flapping the breeze behind you. So, as the wing is moving forward, it's basically got this wind that's flowing over it, and we call that the relative wind, because relatively speaking, it's really a wind that's flowing past the wing. The wing doesn't care whether it's sitting still or whether it's moving through the air, it just cares that there's wind flowing uh, over it. And so we call that the, the relative wind. Um, now, let's take a look at how the airplane, how the wing moving through the air can actually generate this force that can sustain, that can lift the airplane into the air. <clears throat> so, we have the relative wind blowing at the wing. So you've got air coming. And look what happens. This wing is kind of at an angle. And the air that's blowing underneath the wing strikes the bottom surface of the wing. And what happens? It gets deflected downwards. And so you got these air that's getting deflected down like that. And if you remember uh, the, back to your uh, high school physics days, there was a dude named Isaac Newton. Um, he had an enlightening moment when an apple fell on top of his head or something like that. Anyway, the guy we know who discovered gravity, um, he also uh, discovered a lot of other things about physics. And his third law of um, third law of motion, yeah, I'll have to look that up, um, basically uh, explains how this uh, causes a lifting force. Um, when you have any action, when you push against something, that thing pushes back against you. Any action has an opposite and equal reaction. And so, how do we how do we illustrate this? This is a really, e way, really easy way to understand this. We've all done this. We've rolled down our window in the car while we're going down the freeway, and you stick your hand out the window. And what happens when you're going down at yes, you know, going along the freeway at 70 miles per hour? You move your hand and you tilt it up, and it all your hand just wants to pick itself right up. That's exactly what's happening here. Isaac Newton is, a, is at work. You have a force. The wing, the uh, air is being deflected by the wing. The air is being deflected downward. And so, in turn, the wing is being deflected upward. So, that is part of the picture. But it's not the whole piece of the picture because aerodynamics is actually a very complex uh, subject. That's why they have aeronautical engineering. Um, so, let's take a look at the wing again. Um, and... First of all, before we do that, we want to talk about a guy named Bernoulli. This is a Swiss uh, mathematician dude, and he did some interesting experiments with liquids, uh, with fluids. And so what he did, he uh, took a pipe, and he put a narrow spot in the pipe. And so what he was doing, he was measuring... He was flowing. He was running this uh, flow of liquid through there, 
and as it would get to this narrow spot in the pipe that's called a, a venturi, it would uh, have to speed up in order to get through there and maintain the flow um, of water going through. And he measured the pressure of the liquid on either side as well as in there. And you know what he found? He found that when the liquid sped up inside this narrow neck right here, there was a corresponding decrease in pressure. So he had a relatively low pressure area inside this place where the, where the liquid had sped up and relatively high pressure on either side. Now this is very important for our discussion of red dynamics. And I'm just going to take a clean piece of paper because there's not quite enough room right there. <clears throat> it's nice when you have a whiteboard, but it's not nice when that stinks up the whole house. All right, so let's look at our wing again. And remember, the wing has got this relative wind that's blowing over it. Relative wing, uh, the relative wind is uh, acting perpendicular, sorry, parallel to the direction of flight. So we're going forward of the wing, the relative wind is blowing back at us. And so what happens is the wind is coming and meeting this surface of the, uh, the top surface and this we call the curved surface of the, uh, the curvature of the wing surface, we call that camber. So this camber causes the air to get deflected and as it goes over the shape of the wing causes the airflow going over the top of the wing to increase its speed relative to the air that's going underneath the wing. And so if you look at um, like a, a set of molecules that are going by, you know, here's, uh, and they start going around, this starts speeding up relative to the bottom ones. I know it's really messy. And they make it to the trailing edge of the wing before molecules of air on the bottom do, and they even get deflected downwards. And so what did we learn about when a fluid speeds up? Well, it actually works the same thing for gases because a gas is a fluid. When a fluid speeds up, it has a corresponding decrease in pressure. And so what ends up happening is you have lower pressure on top and higher pressure on the bottom. And you can imagine what happens when you have that kind of a situation. That helps produce lift. And like I said, it's not the complete picture. Uh, you can't explain it just by this or just by Isaac Newton, but they're both important parts on how wings develop lift. And like I also said, this uh, as the air accelerates over the top and comes rushing down the back side of the wing, it also makes this downwash effect. And that has a downward, um, that downward motion has the equal and opposite reaction of causing the wind to go up as well. So Isaac Newton at play again. Really cool stuff. So that is how wings fly. Um, but now that we've learned how to harness uh, all that potential, how do we control it? It's kind of like having an atom bomb. Um, there's all this tremendous power at uh, disposal. But uh, how do you control that, um, being able to split the atom? Uh, so um, we're going to take a quick look at that here. going to take this one more time. It all has to do with how much lift is being produced by the wing. That's how you can control the airplane. And the way you control how much lift is being produced by the wing is by varying the angle at which the wing meets the relative wind. Okay, so let's take a look at it here. Remember the relative wind is blowing in the opposite direction of the direction of travel. So our wing is moving forward like that. Relative wind is going like that. Now we got the leading edge of the wing, we got the trailing edge. If we drew an imaginary line from the trailing edge to the leading edge of the wing and we extended it out because that's an imaginary line. We call this line the chord line. So let me just write that there for reference. Strike a chord. 
So that's the chord line. And the amount of lift is determined by the angle at which the wing meets the relative wind. And the way we measure that angle is relative to the chord line. Right there. And we call that angle the angle of attack because it's the angle at which the wing is attacking the air. So we're producing, let's say, this much lift on top of the wing as it's moving forward through the air. What happens when we increase the angle of attack? This is really cool. Okay, we're going to increase the angle right here. So we're going to pitch this wing up, and it's still traveling forward in a forward direction relative to, uh, say, the, the ground right there. And so the relative wind is blowing at it from this angle now. And look at the angle of attack. We've got a big angle of attack right there. And what happens to lift? Lift increases. So that is exactly how we can control our airplane. Just by varying the angle of attack, you can vary the amount of lift that's being produced on the wings. And that is really the basic principle for how uh, you can even pitch the, you can, uh, you know, climb the airplane, descend the airplane, roll the airplane, and all those different maneuvers. So, we have learned a lot today. We have learned how, what we need in order to fly. We need a wing. We've learned what else we need to have with that wing. We need to have an atmosphere to go along with it. And I'm just looking for my uh, notes here. <laughs> we need an atmosphere to go over it. Um, we, so we need an atmosphere for the wing to be able to operate in. We need air to be flowing over that wing. And we even found out, we found out how that wing works, how the lift is produced when you have air flowing over it. And we even learned how to control how much lift is produced by that wing when you have air that's flung over it. But there is also a dark side to lift. And don't you want to know what that is? Well, I certainly do, and that means we're going to have to find out next lesson what the dark side to lift is. Um, and uh, so you have some more reading that you can do. You can go ahead and get started reading uh, the Pilot's Handbook of Aeronautical Knowledge, Chapter 4. And we're going to be able to start delving into aerodynamics and how airplanes can be maneuvered and controlled and all the forces that go into that. And so looking forward to it. So join us next time for more Skybound on the Ground.